In great pain, where is God? In great pain, where is God? It's about 1993, my parents took us as children to Disney World over in Orlando, Florida. We were at MGM Studios. We got on a ride. I remember being on that ride. I forgot I was on a ride at eight years old. I watched as an 18-wheeler flipped over and caught on fire, and the train we were on began to shake. And, and for a few minutes, a few seconds, I just sensed that I wasn't on a ride anymore. And I remember for the first time in life, the ground shaking beneath me, that feeling of panic, of uncertainty. Thankfully, I realized soon thereafter I was at Disney World. It was a ride. This wasn't real. But I'll never forget the first moment I had that sense of panic and uncertainty because the ground beneath me was shaking. You felt the ground beneath you shake before? The marriage is on the brink or it's ended? The boss says, fired. The doctor says, cancer. The financial strain is causing you to buckle. The stress and the anxiety is causing the ground beneath you to feel like it's shaking. The psalmist says this, Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. We have those moments in life, don't we? The psalmist never says that's not going to come. That those moments where the ground beneath us is shaking, those, those moments are going to come. When, when all that is what we've known in this world and this life begins to shake. We can feel like the ground beneath us is shaking. In great pain, where is God? In seasons of groundbreaking uncertainty, where is God? That was the question that Peter Weiner had written about in an article I read recently. He said, after great pain, where is God? And he asked of his own Christian faith, if a child dies, if the cancer does not go into remission, if the marriage breaks apart, how much good is that exactly? We can say that God comforts people in their pain, but is that all we can say? He notes the consolation that comes from being a part of a Christian community and the hope that is found in our eternal inheritance. And he describes the consolation in the conviction that we are part of an unfolding drama with a purpose. An unfolding drama with a purpose. And I think his reflections are especially poignant because at any particular moment in time, I may not have a clue as to what the precise purpose is, but I believe, as a matter of faith, that the story has an author, that difficult chapters need not be defining chapters, and that even the broken areas of our lives can be redeemed. In great pain... Where is God? If you're new to Pioneer Drive or uh, one of our guests here this morning, our church, uh, some of the members of our body right now, it's been a tough time. And within the body, there's a lot of pain and there's a lot of hurt. And the Bible says when, when one part of the body hurts, we all hurt. And and as we come here to the Lord's Supper today, you need to know that there's some people hurting in here. There's the people in the body that hurt. And the pain is very real. 
There's some tough seasons. There's, there's health challenges. That are, there's, there's marriages that are, that are going through some tough times. There's, there's grief. There's loss. There's, there's despair for, for a variety of reasons. It's part of being a part of the body of Christ. We carry those burdens for each other and with each other. But you see this. Difficult chapters need not be defining chapters. You know, difficult chapters are often formational chapters because I don't think God wastes those seasons of our life. But difficult chapters need not be defining chapters of our lives. It was Jesus who prayed and was giving a model for his disciples. He said this in Luke chapter 22. He said, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. That chapter for Jesus, oh, it's in the story. You better believe it, it's in the story. It's there. But as horrible as that was, and the crucifixion was, that was not the defining moment of Jesus' life because we know what happens next, that God would come and would raise him from the dead. But you see, what we, what we learn is that God is in all the chapters and God is in all the seasons of our life. And we cannot always choose our circumstance, but we can always choose our response. We cannot always choose our circumstance, but we can always choose our response. As I've watched and I've looked around and I've been talking with our staff that we're a part of a kingdom of mustard seed and leaven. If you look out, you see the kingdom of God all among us. And I look at the way that some of our people are going through the trial of their life and and the faith on which they stand and the hope that we sing about, they live out. I'm reminded of this. That our faith is most persuasive when it is most tested. Our faith is most persuasive when it is most tested. I want you to think for a minute about the people whose faith has made the greatest impact in your life. Was it their trust? And their faith in the good times or in the bad? In the uncertain? When there's question marks all around? Our faith, church, to the watching world and to one another is most persuasive when It is most tested because those people that we look to, the greats in the faith that the writer of Hebrews writes about that all had to take that step of faith, many of them never fully saw fulfilled what they had been walking towards. It was their trust in the hard times. It was their trust, not when faith in a loving God was easy, but when it was challenged. Because what we learn from Scripture is that God is working in all seasons and he gives us the ability to walk in faith even in our great pain. It was Paul who said in Romans chapter 5, he said, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The truth is, in great pain, God is right there with us. In our hearts, within the body of believers, through the Holy Spirit. And that means that God is willing and able to work and redeem what is broken. Because when we read our scripture, we understand that, that even the broken areas and chapters of our lives can be made new by Jesus. I have an acquaintance, I would say, uh, it's a pastor. We're friends on Facebook. 
I'd put us in the acquaintance category, but I've been following his journey for some time. His name's John Wethington. He, he's about my age. He had a wife diagnosed with an aggressive form of brain cancer nearly two years ago. They have three young children, about the age of mine. God's worked a miracle in this life for them. And that doesn't always happen this side of heaven, and especially with that form of brain cancer. But he recently said something that caught my interest amidst all the other things I was scrolling on Facebook. He said, life is good and makes sense when you live in a death-resurrection paradigm. You're either in a season of fruit or a season of hardship that will one day produce fruit. The locust can't hang around forever. And that's why it doesn't make sense to give up. If you're going to struggle, you might as well hang in there long enough to see the good that God is going to do with it. That framework, that the Christian life makes sense in a death, resurrection, framework, or paradigm. And amidst the pain, and amidst the challenge, and amidst the uncertainty that we carry as a body, that we carry individually, will we come today to the Lord's table? We come today to His table. And we're reminded that it was Jesus who went through great pain. It was Jesus who went through great pain. He came and he, he gave his body for us. It frees us from our sin. It grants us eternal life today and forevermore. But that in our pain, we have a God who has gone before us. That the difficult chapters need not be defining chapters. We can't always choose our circumstance, but we can choose our response. That we have a God who identifies with us in our suffering, sympathizes with us in our temptation. That even the broken and rough and messy and junky areas of our life can be made new because Jesus was crushed for our iniquity. He did it for us. Great pain from a great God. And so today we're celebrating the Lord's Supper as a church family. How do you come to the table today? How do you come to the table today? A season of pain, a season of uncertainty, maybe a season of plenty and joy. The invitation from Jesus is to come just as we are, whether it's a season of fruit and bounty or whether it's a season where you would say, Pastor, I am broken, I am, I'm wounded, I come because this is a meal, this, this table is for hungry people, and if you're hungry for Jesus, the meal is for you. There's a picture, in fact, it's the absolute earliest picture we have of the church. It's a painting in a catacomb. It dates back to the first half of the second century. This is roughly a hundred years after Jesus ascended into heaven. When the earliest Christians set out to paint a picture of their community, this is how they depicted themselves. Sitting at a table, and there's fish, and there's wine, and they're looking at one another. Translated, this, the title of this painting is The Breaking of Bread, the earliest image we have of the church of our Lord Jesus. They're taking the Lord's Supper this is a powerful meal. It's a powerful symbol. It's not just a symbol. It's a powerful symbol because coming to the Lord's table is not a reward for the godly. It's a gift for the broken. It's not a reward for the godly. It is a gift for the broken, for hungry people who say, the only hope I have is Jesus Christ, my Lord. I shared this quote with you last week, but it's worth noting again that when Jesus himself, this comes from N.T. Wright, wanted to explain to his disciples what his forthcoming death was all about, he didn't give them a story, he gave them a meal, and it's a meal we're going to take together today. This morning we're going to celebrate the supper of our Lord. 
We've been redeemed by Jesus. And he is right here with us. And as a church family, here in celebration worship, in our gathering services, 9 o'clock, 11.15, we're coming hungry to his table for more of Jesus. I'm going to ask our deacons to begin preparing the Lord's Supper. Earlier in our service, Paul would write, we read from Paul's letter to the Corinthians. He said, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so this is a proclamation. It's a proclamation that Christ came to give his life for us. He came for you. He came for me. He came for us. He received what he did not deserve. His body was given for you. It was given for me. It's a time here at the Lord's table for us to be put back together to be made whole, to be reminded of what Jesus has done for us, to be reminded that that we are loved and that we have an invitation to come to the table, that what we're doing is something we do in remembrance of Jesus, that we are loved, that we are forgiven, that it is his sacrifice that makes us whole, that renews that restores, that redeems, that reconciles. Lord's Supper is an invitation to step towards God's table where everyone has enough and everyone has a place. So as we gather, we're here to remember Jesus in the present moment. As we symbolically, we can't all just come literally right around the table, but symbolically as we gather, we gather with a church family, and we remember Jesus. As we take this meal, we may be in a room where people have gossiped about us, or hurt us, or wronged us. Remember that night that Jesus fed Judas. So if there's some relationships that maybe for you are out of whack, not where they need to be, as far as it depends on you, would you make a commitment to make it right? Would you do that? And as we have that hurt and pain and we come to the Lord's table grieving the loss of a loved one, facing uncertain days, as we contemplate our own Mortality. We, we remember Jesus. And one of the songs we sing in our invitation time here pretty often is, is just I, as I am. And, and we come broken to be mended. We come wounded to be healed. We come desperate to be rescued. We come empty to be filled. We come guilty to be pardoned. We come by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And we are welcomed, welcomed with open arms just as we are. Coming to the Lord's table is not a reward for the godly. It's a gift for the broken. It's a family meal for those who want to remember the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus for the forgiveness of their sin. And this morning, for whatever reason, and you don't owe anybody else an explanation, you may just not feel led to participate today. That's between you and the Lord. But here in just a few moments, I'm going to have a moment of silent prayer for us to get our hearts right, to reflect, and then our deacons will serve us, we'll read scripture, and we'll remember Jesus by taking the bread and then the cup. And as I've been praying, just sensing that this morning, God has something for each of us but that the love of God would just surround and envelop this church and his people in a magnificent way today. So in this moment, Jesus did this to show us how much he loved us. Would you receive that love? Would you hear the heart of a father gave his son 
for you and for me. Let's have a moment of silent prayer. Lord, in this moment, we say thank you. We are not worthy. And yet, we receive your gift. Your body given for us. Your blood spilled for us. That we might be redeemed. Take us as we are, Lord. Transform us into who you want us to be. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Deacons, you may now distribute the supper of our Lord. tells us about this sacred time when he says when the hour came Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer for I tell you I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God after taking the cup he gave thanks and said take this and divide it among you for I tell you I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and he gave thanks, 
broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We do this in remembrance of Jesus, the body of Christ given for you. That word eagerly, Lord, wow. Eagerly, you wanted to eat with your disciples and show them what we we just did because of what you were about to do. Thank you for giving yourself for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Our deacons are now going to distribute the cup of our Lord. Luke says that in the same way after the supper, he took the cup, saying this cup is the new covenant. New covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Christ's blood poured out for you. We drink in remembrance of Jesus. Lord, we are mindful you are enough. You are enough. You gave your life for us. You have redeemed us. You have restored us. You have reconciled us. Your sacrifice is enough once for all. No more. 
And we say thank you, Lord, and we praise you, for you are good. And your goodness has been poured out on us and in this body of believers. And we say, we say thank you, Lord. We truly cannot do it without you. We would be nothing without you. And so today we come to proclaim your death and your resurrection. And we come to say, thank you, thank you, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.